Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Welcome back, everybody. Thank you so much. We have a great conversation today, but first I want to point out that my guests are so knowledgeable and so giving in sharing that today's guest, Nicole Will, is back again to talk about the topic we had originally planned. I got confused and went off on a caring for the caregiver topic, and she rolled with it so well that I didn't even realize we (laughs) technically recorded the wrong topic until we were all done. So she's back to give us even more advice on the dynamic between families and senior living communities and their employees. So welcome back, Nicole. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, It's always fun to visit with you. Welcome back, listeners. Thank you so much for joining us today. I have a fantastic guest for you. Her name is Rebecca Chop. She is living with Alzheimer's. She wrote a book, which, because we've been chatting since I asked her the name of the book, (laughs) oh, it's still me, um, and I can't remember the subtitle, but I'll let her tell you about that. And so today we're going to talk about early diagnosis, lifestyle changes, and how Rebecca is still living a very full life with Alzheimer's. So thanks for joining me, Rebecca. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. So I know you were college president, right? Why don't you give us your pre-Alzheimer's history on you? Tell us who you are then, now, and then we'll go into what you're doing to stay healthy. Okay. Um, I was raised in Kansas and I wasn't even supposed to go to college. Girls didn't go to college in my era, but um, through an odd series of events, I went to college and (laughs) ended up being very good at school. And went on, uh, first went to seminary. I was interested in religion, then got my PhD at the University of Chicago. And I taught at Emory for 14 years. And then I became provost. And I loved administration. I loved solving problems. I loved building community. I loved kind of envisioning with others how to move a place forward. So I was president at Colgate University at Swarthmore College and then uh, came to the University of Denver as chancellor. I'd always wanted to be in Denver. Uh, I was five years into my presidency and I loved my job. Things were going great. Um, Went to my primary care physician, thought I was fine. Things were a little different for me, but I didn't know about signs of Alzheimer's other than memory loss and I wasn't having memory loss. So my doctor asked me how I was doing. And I said, great, Uh, I'm sleeping nine hours a night. I'd never slept that much. I'd always slept four and a half, five hours since I was a child. And she said, oh. And then I laughed and I said, oh, I got lost to your office. Now I had been getting lost and I haven't gotten lost since, but I got lost that day. At the end of my meeting with her, she asked if I'd take a mini cognitive exam. She knew what I didn't know. She knew that any change in normal behavior, especially when you're older, can be a sign of some kind of neurological problem. So I took the mini cognitive exam thinking I'd pass because I'm It said I was a really good student. (laughs) I didn't. So uh, she sent me on for more tests. I had MRIs. I had an insulin PET scan because Denver doesn't have amyloid PET scan machine yet. Um, And in March 2019, wow, just about five years ago, huh? I was diagnosed with MCI due to Alzheimer's. Mm. Thank yeah. goodness she knew she knew that it was not normal. Yes, so good. And so many doctors don't don't know all the signs and they're under so much pressure, right? I mean, they have 
such a short time, but she did. And, you know, all the organizations connected with Alzheimer's are now working hard to make sure all the doctors know what she knew that day. Do you happen to know if she, she must have had experience with Alzheimer's or other dementia causing disease? Cause that's, that's still really rare. Unfortunately, many older doctors will dismiss it as just age related or tell you, Oh yeah, I get lost driving places too, which is terrifying. <laughs> it's horrible. I so agree. So many doctors still dismiss it. I have friends who told me because of my diagnosis, they've gone in. In fact, one of my siblings went in and her doctor said, Oh yeah, nah, you're fine. You know, my mother died of Alzheimer's. My grandmothers both died of Alzheimer's. I have Alzheimer's and my sister's doctor is dismissing it. So I don't know. Uh, I know that uh, my primary care physician is uh, exceptionally good. And she has been with my husband too. So I don't know if she's just super smart or super attentive. I don't know that she has Alzheimer's in her family, but she did catch it. And I agree, it's extremely rare. So you got lucky and didn't, it didn't take years to be diagnosed. Correct. Not that lucky is exactly the word you want to use for that diagnosis, but, you know, it does open up options. And before we were recording, I asked Rebecca if she was a candidate for the Lakembi treatment, <clears throat> excuse me, which she is but she is with the Kaiser Foundation healthcare system, which I was until 2024, and they don't have it yet because I've learned that it's not just simply adding this new treatment to what everything else hospitals do. There's a whole protocol that they have to establish. So we're hoping that she might be a candidate for the next one, which is Denanumab which I hope I'm pronouncing correctly. Yes, you did. <laughs> yeah, you did. I've heard it enough times with the Alzheimer's Association. Um, but in your opinion, why is getting an early diagnosis so important? Oh, it's, it's so important. You know, I do have people tell me, why would you even want to know? But that question, I think, comes in part from the belief that there's nothing you can do. And I myself, when I got diagnosed, you know, sank into despair. I mean, because I thought you walked out of your doctor's office with that diagnosis, and in a year or two, you'd be a, you know, you'd be in bad shape, dependent, lose my mind. But the earlier the diagnosis, the more you can do. One, lifestyle changes can keep you healthy. In those who don't have Alzheimer's, the research is showing that lifestyle changes may prevent the onset of Alzheimer's until your mid-90s, if you're still alive. But if you have Alzheimer's, it can keep, you know, the body builds the brain. Okay. So it's not going to cure the disease, but it may keep you so healthy that the symptoms may not develop as rapidly. So lifestyle changes the medications. Uh, Lakimbi and soon Denonimab are just the first of so many. Right now, all the medications that we know about are only effective in the early stages. Mm -hmm. So if you wait until, say, you can't button your shirt, you're really having trouble with your independence, those medications aren't going to help you. So the earlier you know, again, these medications don't cure the disease, but they delay the disease, which is incredible. And third, and I think really important is, you know, like any other serious disease or terminal disease, uh, it makes you live forward in all sorts of new ways. I mean, you know, I'm more attentive to my husband. I take more joy in my mountains. I took a painting, uh, paying forward to your family and friends and to society. You know, there is, there is nothing <laughs> like a disease that gives you focus. And, and, and really, and, and all the research shows is a kind of openness to awe in new ways. So I think those are three reasons, good reasons, 
to get diagnosed as soon as possible. And and you owe it to your family to also oh, I, get that. Diagnosis. I agree with that. So I don't know if you remember from our prior conversation, which seems like it was forever ago. <laughs> Uh, my mom had Alzheimer's for 20 years. Right. My maternal wow. grandmother had mixed dementias, starting with vascular, but I am assuming based on um, the end stages with her that it, she also had Alzheimer's. And then my maternal great-grandmother also had dementia, yeah. of which at that she died before I was born. I was born in the end mm -hmm. of 66, so I don't think they, they didn't have all the knowledge of the different yeah. causes. So I yeah. don't know what her diagnosis was because yeah. I don't think she had one. So before I knew much about Alzheimer's, I I was a photographer. I had a client that was a doctor and mm. my dad's side of the family has tons of diabetes and I was mm. severely, severely overweight. And she said, you have a family history of diabetes. Wow. You're overweight. You're screwed. Wow. I was like, wow. I'll show you. And I did. I lost over a hundred pounds. I've kept it off uh, for eleven years. Congratulations! Yes. Um, so I, I tell people I belong to the cult of Peloton, and <laughs> you know, you have to find the exercise that you can tolerate for the rest of your life. Yeah. I can't say that I enjoy sweating out in a cold garage <laughs> right now, or working out in the hot garage in the summer. But you know. My goal to lose weight was to avoid the diabetes, which I have then learned in the past that also was very important to my brain. So right. it's, you know, and I've, as I get older, I eat more vegetarian, which Good. I'm not That's sure cool. why. I just don't really want beef and other things. Yeah. Just they're more appealing. So, you know, it's not that Good hard to you. make changes when you make them, you know, don't try to change everything at once. Pick something. Right. Just, I'm going to go for a 15 minute walk every day this week. And then Absolutely. once you manage that, then add, I'm going to cut back on alcohol or I'm going to cut back on fatty foods because those are terrible for you. Yeah, absolutely the worst. Or processed foods oh, for your brain, processed foods, so bad. Yeah, it's funny because I'm we we're, we need to renovate our 1988 kitchen. It's very dysfunctional <laughs> and I'm very focused on getting a smart microwave, which can read barcodes on packages and nice. properly heat your food. But I don't have any food with barcodes on it. Not really. Yeah, right. It's like, well, I don't yeah. know how much this smart microwave will help me, but I'm still getting one. <laughs> well, my, my biggest challenge in diet, because though I've eaten fairly healthy in my life, um, the doctor, of course, said, you know, it, it a mind diet. A mind diet is a version of Mediterranean, and it's a diet designed for neurological functioning. And it's just, you know, blueberries and lots of walnuts, but avoiding all processed food. So that's okay. I can give up. You know, I, I never was big into cereals and all that stuff. That's fine. Until I learned that ice cream is a processed food. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, I love ice cream. So that too. was hard, but you know, my new love is Indian food. So where I live is rich in wonderful Indian food. Lots of people from India have moved here and they've opened up restaurants and I have taken some cooking classes. So lentils trump ice cream. They really can. Once you oh, get okay. used to it, you put enough spices on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I actually made... Um, lentil balls, which I might have for lunch today now that I think oh. about it. But I have a, I have a, an option for your ice cream fix. Okay. Not quite as, I was devastated when Ben and Jerry's discontinued their frozen yogurt. Cause yeah. that was, that was great. And it was much less fat than yes. ice cream. Cause trust me, I'm still lugging around pounds of ice cream <laughs> in certain <laughs> areas <laughs> because I... I'm like you. I love ice cream. Ice cream is... Americans love ice cream. Yeah, ice cream is awesome. But I have these frozen yogurt. They're Greek yogurt bars. Oh, I've heard of those. Yeah, Yasso. Y-A-S-S-O. -S 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 They're yeah. very good. Yeah. You know, yeah. are they as rich and creamy as ice cream? No. But, no. you know, <clears throat> it helps. It helps that, it help. it that helps little that need. Gravy. And yeah. it, it doesn't kick your... I don't know about you, but I have to wrestle with a sugar beast all the time. Oh, 
Yeah. And it's, yeah. I'm not one of those people. I have had nutritionists tell me, just go quit cold turkey. And <laughs> one time somebody said this in front of my husband and my daughter, and the expressions on their faces was pure horror. Ah. They're like, no, 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 no. People will die. <laughs> we cannot do that. And they oh, weren't kidding. Fun. So well, yeah, I'm not a like, big like, sugar person. Uh, and it's fine with me. My do- uh, Other than ice cream, my doctor said, you know, follow this diet 90 to 95% of the time. So that allows me once a month to have something. That's good. Yeah. Mod- mod- moderation. Blah, blah. Yeah. Yes. I can speak. So what else do you do that's keeping you healthy? Yeah. I think really important for brain health uh, is exercise. Um, you mentioned the Peloton. Um, I have uh, exercised since maybe I was 45 or so for stress because of my jobs. Uh, and I liked it. I mean, it you know, it was okay. But I knew that when my doctor said two hours a day, I was oh. going to love it. So I got a puppy. I'd always wanted a puppy. I'd got, I'd had rescue dogs. My husband didn't want a puppy, but how could he say no to a wife who'd just been diagnosed with Alzheimer's? So I got a little mini Husky. And so I walked that dog about an hour in the morning and then throughout the rest of the day, about another hour. And we walk fast. And then I also do strength training, choreography, some type, usually maybe just some kind of dancing. They're all, they're all these new classes and you don't have to be a real dancer. And I tried line dancing. It was too much for my mind. I, I really couldn't, couldn't follow the directions, but through all these, there's one now I go to called soul groove. And as far as I can tell, the teacher basically puts on great music and says, now, you know, make sure you step to your right, step to your left or twirl around or something. But it's all about choreographing your brain to your body. So I do that about two hours a day, um, at least. And, you know, I think the key is finding something you love. And or at least can tolerate. Be, <laughs> yeah. Or if you life. really hate exercise, tolerate or you know, walking, uh, gardening is a great exercise. Uh, ping pong and pickleball, I don't do those, but they're really great uh, for challenging your mind as well as your body. So, you know, dancing around the house. My doctor said, if you can't do anything else, put the music of your youth on uh, when your husband is away and just dance around the house. So I think exercise is really key. We know that exercise uh, releases hormones that calm the mind, uh, that occasionally grow the hippopalamus, the place where memories reside, allow neurons to connect in new ways. And that's really how I wrote my book. Oh, I'll give you the full title. (laughs) Still Me, Accepting Alzheimer's Without Losing Yourself. And it's on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. Noble, but I uh, would exercise with my dog, and you know he he he's an active dog. He doesn't just waddle. We yeah, huskies are they're at, they're high energy. Yes, high energy. And uh, I would come home after an hour of exercise, and I could sit down for about two hours. And so over a year, I did that, and I wrote my book. Um, so I think exercise is just key. It keeps your body well, builds your body for your brain, but it has additional benefits for your brain. Uh, another thing I did was creativity. And you and I have talked about this before. Um, I was kind of surprised when my doctor, my neurologist said, pick up art, music, dance. That's a two for creativity and exercise. Uh, a gardening, another two for it, woodworking, anything. And the field, the emerging field of neuroaesthetics, aesthetics tells us um, that the old book by Betty Edwards, The Right Side of Your Brain, which is a really wonderful book, probably not scientific, that's more a metaphor than good science, but the book is accurate. The artistic aspect of your brain 
helps form new neural pathways and it calms your brain. It gets rid of the inflammation, which is what we want to do in all this healthy uh, living for the brain healthy lifestyle. So I have a friend who had Alzheimer's in her family. And after she heard my diagnosis, said to me, you've got to learn to paint. And I said, oh, no, uh-uh, not me. I'm one of those kids who in first grade, the teacher said, eh, probably not art classes for you. And my mother reinforced that. So I never did art. Uh, and when she tried to teach me, I kind of threw a tantrum. But then I got into it. And today I paint professional portraits. I do a lot of abstracts. Um, we were talking about greeting cards. I do any. I do anything from the ridiculous to the sublime, <laughs> and I love it. Um, I'm a very spiritual person, and a friend of mine who paints says, "Painting is like being in the heart of God." And there is just something, or the universe, or however you want to say it, there is just something so calming. And, you know, we want to stay as calm as we can or counter set our anxiety because anxiety radically increases inflammation. So I think creativity, exercise, diet is really key. So we almost have to live like the, the hippie lifestyle. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's not necessarily bad. Maybe not a... the psychedelic part, but yeah. <laughs> You know, they might start experimenting with that. They're well, gonna... I think there is a few experimentations going on. I know there is for like PTSD and depression. Yeah. Which yeah. It's all, that's all mental. So you never know. They might, they might yeah, veer off in that direction next. Yeah. That would be interesting. So I'm a photographer and I have the same right. kind of feeling. There's times when I was photographing families and you could just feel like yeah. it was just, something would come over you and i i yeah. distinctly remember that um that feeling very strong when i was yeah. photographing a family that had lost a son uh, uh, i didn't know that until they showed up because obviously that's really not something people just blurt out yeah. to the stranger they're talking to and we had the most beautiful sunset and i was like i'm uh, not religious but you could almost not yeah it, you had to acknowledge that something was going on <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, you're just connected to universal awe at that point or whatever. It, it is really interesting. I, I do want to mention that one of the newest research studies is showing that even doodling hmm. can have this impact on reducing anxiety in the brain. So many people say to me, oh, I could never paint. Well, that's me. I, I said that too. And you know, we all forget that before we spoke and wrote, we drew and danced and colored as a child. But that's okay. But if you're intimidated by painting or music of any kind, you can doodle. You can also listen to music. There's phenomenal research that even listening to music reduces anxiety in the brain. Hmm. I'm wondering how... The music is a really big part of the Peloton workouts, mm -hmm. re regardless of what you're doing. And they have dance cardio, which mm -hmm. I should do more of, but I have to learn the choreography so that I can really get a good workout in because mm -hmm. when you're just tripping over your feet, it's not really a very good workout. Right, right. <laughs> um, but, you know, you can pick the music. Like this morning I did a 45-minute 80s ride, and it's just like, you know, I graduated from high school in 84. So it's like 80s music is my era. Yeah. And you were, it's, it's sometimes, you know, you pick an instructor based on like kind of like your mood. There's some that are yeah. motivational, some that are just funny. Yeah. And I, I'm i always astounded that these, these people can, they're performers that also yeah, they are. are, you know, physical instructors. But it's just amazing. I'm wondering how. The music definitely plays a role. Now I'm curious yeah. as to like what it's doing to your brain. You're yeah. working out, you're putting your body under some duress, but you got this music that's making you feel really good. Hmm. Yeah. I wanna, yeah. You have to contemplate yeah, on that it's one. It's just bombarding your brain with all those good chemicals. That's probably true. It's probably why you get addicted to 
that's why you end up in the cult of Peloton, as I like to say. Yeah, right. But um, on the doodling, I have seen, and I don't know what the technical term is, but if you, you if you just draw like wavy lines and where the lines connect so that you would have like a sharp V kind of mm -hmm. overlap, you then go in and, and soften those curves by making like a little U, that that right. is extremely calming for yeah, you know, it's good for people who actually suffer from anxiety. And I've done that a little bit just for fun. Yeah. Um, but the reason I yeah. like making homemade greeting cards is because you pretty much can't screw it up. And if you do, it's yeah. just a little bit of ink, a little Me bit too. of paper, you know, you could chop and it up. Or... Loves them. Yeah. And, you know, I think also we we know and we don't even need Alzheimer's research to tell us this. Um, doing something like that and giving it to someone and making them happy Um is also an anxiety reducer and a confidence builder. So, you know, giving back, being engaged in any way. Yeah, I gave um, two Christmases in a row. I've given my neighbors gift boxes full of cards because. Oh, nice. Good idea. I will, I, well, one, so what was it 22? I, in 2022, I'm like, I'm going to see how many different types of birthday cards I can make. You know, wow. girly, kid, whatever. How many, what, how many, I got up to 60 and I was like, I don't have this many friends. So I had to figure yeah. out a way to get rid of them. And so I just, I have gift boxes left from when I used to package up portraits and I just started like dealing them into the boxes. And so this past year in the spring, I asked my husband, I'm like, do you think the neighbors and a couple of our friends would would want another box because I got this pile of cards again because I just get going. Yeah, and, it's great. Um, my next door neighbor was ecstatic to get another box because she used all but one. And the one card That's she great. didn't use in 2023 was basically cards that I made for 4th of July for kind of, um, uh, what is it, like a pay it forward kind of like yeah. simple act of kindness. Oh, like, nice. You know, give the Good. people at our... So we have a gated community. Give those people at the gate who are working yeah. on a holiday or whatever, like, hey, we appreciate that, you know, you're doing a good job. Here's here's a card. And, you know, so it really nice. does make a difference. I want to see I, your cards. you got to put them on your website. <laughs> well, if I get a little more time, I do plan on starting an Etsy store, but I'm very oh, particular on which ones are good enough for that. And I just need to build up a inventory, but, you know. Life is busy yeah. right now. I wanted to follow up on the notion of friends and neighbors and community because we know that's also important, that social engagement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I was pretty amazed. Was it a year ago or two years ago that the Surgeon General declared loneliness an epidemic in our society? Mm -hmm. And that's very sad. Uh, loneliness for uh, especially the aging or the uh, people with debilitating illnesses is a co-determinant of Alzheimer's, loneliness and depression. And of course, the moment you get that diagnosis, you want to withdraw, if not before. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's another sign of, of Alzheimer's is wanting to withdraw. But it's so important to be engaged. Um, I... We live in an over 65 community. We just moved in after my a year after my diagnosis. And, you know, I have found neighbors and some groups. I belong to three book clubs. Um, and, and that's a great form of engagement for me because I love to read, but I don't really like chit chat. But whatever it is, you know, a men's coffee group. Um, my husband and I are religious, so we go to church, whatever it is to stay well as a human being, you've got to belong. <laughs> so you've got to find ways. Um, and if you can find ways that engage your mind, for me, a book club does that even better. Or, you know, learn a new hobby, learn a new card game or something like that. It's that, that notion of friends and engagement, extremely important for Alzheimer's. So we have friends that like to do games, um, which is fun. Um, and then in our, so we moved a little over two years ago, we moved two hours away from my hometown uh, and in my attempts to meet new people, I started a card making club. And so I teach people oh, how to do cards and 
I try to show them techniques that they can do. Like we did one where you um, use shaving cream and drops of ink. So like the concentrated <laughs> ink and one gal, and I don't have any um, food color, but she says, I think you can do this with food color. And I'm like, I think you could because food coloring is also concentrated. And then you, you know, make a little bit of a pattern in the shaving cream and you um, dip the card base into it and then you scrape off the shaving cream and it's what's fun is you're not sure how it's going to look until you scrape it all off oh it's fun i want to it come is. and take yeah <laughs> part of that club or have you do videos i should i, I should it's you do videos i just i just need more time <laughs> yeah yeah we all do i know i know i know life is so busy and i don't think modern life is actually that good for our brains there's some things no. that are good like staying connected with people like i do through zoom and, you know, I'm doing a presentation this evening and that's going to be live, which I don't get very often. So that's going to be fun, I think. <laughs> it's, it'll be different. So that'll be, that's a good thing. And then, yeah. you know, we have a golden retriever who is over the top social. And if she doesn't get yeah. her morning mm -hmm. walks, she gets grumpy. And then in the good. afternoon, she's bored. Yeah. So these are not yeah. good things for the dog's health. So we take her out. And she will make sure that anybody that comes near her has the opportunity to pet her. So she's a very yeah. good icebreaker. If we can't, if yeah. I can't get her out to the, to do a walk, if it's raining or really cold, I will take her to, I took her to the Dollar Tree to get the shaving cream for the class. Yeah. Yeah. I go to Home Depot or Michael's. We have a lot of Michael's stores in Colorado. So Michael's are very dog friendly as is Home Depot. So that's yeah, what Yeah, that's we her go. other favorite store because the employees take, you know, like a two or three minute mental health break to pet the dog. Yeah, it's good. It's good. And of course, she just totally eats it up. It's, it's yeah. funny. And if you watch her, if, you, if we're standing and talking in a group of people, she will literally go from person to person. Yeah. Very subtly, but she wants to make sure if there's five of you, if all five of you get the chance to pet her, it is hysterical. Yeah. That's why they those dogs make such good therapy dogs. The breed is so good. My breed, not so good, but. Yeah, I think Huskies are more one people dog, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He kind of, you know, occasionally he might let somebody pet him, but not too often. And he likes female dogs, but he doesn't like male dogs. Oh, my dog likes everybody, especially yeah. her favorite people are the Safeway delivery drivers because <laughs> it's a human bringing food. Woohoo! Big. Yeah, exciting. <laughs> yeah. So it's fun to take her out because you can't. I've learned I used to do the outdoor power walks with Peloton yeah. and her and we had another dog until about a year ago and I was pausing the walk class all the time to talk to my neighbors i'm like forget it i'm just gonna go out I with am. the dog and it never disappoints there's always somebody to talk to so well know. that's it you know that's it i mean think of what you're getting you're getting social engagement you're getting exercise and in my book i talk a little bit about the research now with uh pet companionship and alzheimer's you know, they, I mean, I know people who got Alzheimer's and they got rid of their pets because they thought again, this old notion that, you know, in two years, they would be lose their independence. But now the research is showing that pets kind of can keep you well. And again, the exercise and companionship you get from a pet is really great. That's interesting. So my mom, we I've had dogs all my life and my I grew up with black miniature poodles, primarily female. And when the dog that my parents had when my mom was in the middle to later stages, mm -hmm. all she had to do was look at my mom for attention, pets, mm -hmm. whatever, and my mom would feed her. So this poor dog, black oh, miniature poodle I... should weigh about 15 pounds. She weighed 28. That's so. what my grand, one of my grand, my, I told you both my grandmothers and mother also had it. And one of my grandmothers, she did the same thing. She'd forget. She wouldn't eat herself, but she'd feed the dog all day. The dog ate four times a day. <laughs> yeah. It's sad. Well, I give my dog, because we lost so much. So the dog we have now, her name is Luna. When we got her at eight weeks, she was the baby of three. I had a pack of three Goldens. Then she was the middle of three, and then she was the oldest of two. And unfortunately uh -huh. with Goldens, they are highly um, susceptible to cancers. 
Right. And her younger companion got an aggressive liver tumor mm -hmm. this time last year, and we lost him on February 27th, 23. And, you know, we were definitely not ready for another one. She loves to travel. She don't care where we're going. She loves mm -hmm. to go to the vet. She don't care. Where are we going? She just wants to go. He was a terrible traveler. So we're no like, fun. we're taking this big trip to Glacier National mm -hmm. Parks. We're not even going to consider a dog till September. So September has come and gone. You know, we're we're trying yeah. to figure out if it's a good idea or not. She's nine and a half. Um, so she's really super spoiled. But she gets her dinner in the, the Kong that you roll around for the kettle yeah. to come out. And she has gotten amazingly quick at getting her yeah. food. You know, she picks it up and rolls it around. But I do that to keep her, like, stimulated because I asked yeah, the yeah. vet, like, you know, we're not ready for another one. We're not sure what we're going to do. Like, but what do I do for her? Because she went from being, you know, part of three and then two, and now she's an only at yeah. eight and a half. And that's what he told me to do is the, basically the food puzzles, which she has mm -hmm. two. But I like the one where she has to actually move and not just yeah, stand there and around open yeah. the thingies to get her food out. <laughs> so I tell people, yeah, my caregiving these days is a golden retriever. <laughs> <laughs> you know, caregiving, it, I just went to the uh, Alzheimer's Association National Summit in New Orleans, and it's to thank all the volunteers. And of course, I always love your Alzheimer's flowers. And <laughs> so there were about 1,300 people there. And... Uh, there were just maybe 10 of us who have Alzheimer's, but mainly it was for the volunteers for the Alzheimer's Association. And, you know, most everybody's a caregiver or was mm -hmm. like yourself. And, you know, the stories they told, um, so, so powerful. And, you know, what caregivers do and their love and their frustration and their 24 seven work and as somebody who will be dependent upon a caregiver or caregivers, I mean, it, I really, you know, I stand in awe. They say there's about 11 million unpaid caregivers in this country for Alzheimer's alone, and that's going to grow. And I think that's an undercount because I think a lot of, like, your husband might not consider himself a caregiver. He's just doing yeah. what he's supposed to do. Yeah, so yeah, I think, I think so too. I think there's a lot of people that don't, yeah. you know, or they're... They're like a casual caregiver. They help out here and there. So they don't consider yeah. themselves caregivers. They're just taking you to the doctor or mowing your lawn or whatever. Right. You know, they're not doing necessarily day-to-day -day stuff, but they're still caregivers. So, yeah, you know, it's, a, it's. And, you know, you think about how many more we will have with Alzheimer's because what is it? 10,000 a day turned 65. Yeah. America, 10,000 a day. And it's primarily a disease for those over 65. Although, you know, the early onset Alzheimer's numbers are pretty significant. I think it's 6% or so of those with Alzheimer's have early onset. But, you know, it's it's just this problem is going to grow and grow and grow. All the more reason for people to learn about early diagnosis and the treatments. And all the more for people to walk to end Alzheimer's, which raises money for that research. Yep. So anyway, the rally was incredible after the, I have to tell just this story because uh, the Alzheimer's Association, along with other organizations, they're all so wonderful. So they had 1,300 of us in a room and I gave a speech and there were other speeches, you know, and, and then there was supposed to be a reception. None of us knew what was going on. They herded us out to Canal Street and there were bands and people on stilts and the whole Mardi Gras bras parade. And we walked down to the Fillmore, which is a jazz hall to listen to jazz. And what a thank you for these volunteers. Yeah, I'm wondering why I didn't get invited. I'm a volunteer. <laughs> oh, well, I, you just, you have to, I think the local chapters, you have to, you have to ask your local chapter to send you next year. It's lots of fun. Yeah, because I went to D.C. last year. That was my first yeah. time to D.C. Yeah. ever, but with the Alzheimer's Ooh. Association. That was only about 900, I think. Yeah, and that course, was, uh, yeah, that was the, uh, I can't remember what they call that, but that was a political summit yeah. where they got the White House and stuff. Really important. Yeah, where you get to go harass your legislators. 
Yeah. That's Important. what I referred to it as. And of course, from California, there was a very big contingency. You know, we had the most people, which shouldn't be surprising because we're the most populous state. I, was, I just read something with somebody else. They thought Florida was. I'm like, I don't think so. I think we're still oh, no, number I don't one. Think so. Temporarily, yeah. maybe, but I think we're still number yeah. one. Um, you know, 40 million people in a state's a lot of people. Yeah. Um, but I was going to ask you, so you said it's been almost five years. Has, have you noticed a progression or has it been fairly stable because of what you've been doing to stay healthy? I think... It's been very stable cognitively. I mean, that I can be in three book clubs, that I can write a book, um, that I'm on the National Board of the Alzheimer's Association. I'm on a couple of other important boards for Alzheimer's. Uh, where I notice it is I continue to sleep now 10 hours a night, not nine, plus naps. And I do occasionally get more anxious, you know, um, Anxiety comes with this disease, so I'll have, you know, just some really bad anxiety kind of problems. So that's where something like painting, walking my dog, you know, helps deflect that anxiety. But uh, but I'm good. My husband says I have a little bit more memory loss, and I imagine that's true, but, but nothing too noticeable. That's good. That's yeah, really if I could good. stay like this for five or six more years, I'd be really happy. A lot of people are skeptical of the benefits of the treatments because, you know, it just slows down the progression. But it, I try to remind them that if you're old enough, which you might not be yet, the, if it slows it down, you may pass away from something else other than the later stages of Alzheimer's, which my mom basically got to miss most of that because she fell and broke her leg right at the start yeah. of COVID. And that was the last straw for her yeah. body. Um, but you know, I know people well, whose loved ones are bed bound and have to be fed. And if you can skip that stage, that'd be great. <laughs> absolutely. And you know, you never know when there's going to be a cure. I mean, I don't think there will be a cure in my lifetime. I'm 72. Uh, and if it is, I hope it goes to the younger people first, you know, the 49 or 52 year olds with early onset. I hope it I hope the medicines get directed there first because those people with families. And, but, you know, I have a good life. I'm giving back. I'm contributing to society. Um, I'm still me. <laughs> um, yes, if I can extend that good life, that life of giving back and stuff, contributing, I would love to do so. And if I can extend that five to 10 years, that's great. Um yeah, I don't need, I really, you know, I really do not want to go through the bedridden, bedridden, don't know my son. Those are heartbreaking. They're heartbreaking. Yeah. I knew my mom didn't recognize me as yeah. her daughter because I'd lost so much weight. I hardly recognized me. So oh, it was, it was you. not a surprise when I confirmed that she didn't remember our yeah. relationship, but she thought yeah. I was her best friend. So I'm like, hmm, yeah, that, might, that might be an upgrade. Yeah. You know, understanding that you're not going to forget your son. You just forget the relationship. You know, you can't I, connect that <laughs> face to this term, but you know, you have strong feelings for this person. And right. we Somebody always laugh. Alzheimer's Association, a guy told this wonderful story about his mother in the later stages. Um, she walked in one day with, her care partner or husband to see him at work and she didn't recognize him. And she said, you know, I'm so-and-so, who are you? And he said, well, I'm Jay. And she said, oh, my son's name is Jay. Do you know him? And he said, I do. And she said, isn't he the best kind of guy? <laughs> so she, and he was saying, you know, blessing and sadness too, but you know, they do know people. do. Yeah. Know. My mom always told like anybody we'd run across, she's like, she's my best friend. I've known her forever. And, I, and the caregivers in the memory care residence where she lived, we'd all laugh because it's like, yeah, you think you've been known, you know me forever. <laughs> you've known me longer than anybody else, lady. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, well, it's, it's, you know, you, you, you know, in those later stages, um, I don't know that I can say still me, but you know, it bubbles up in different ways, as you say. 
-hmm. Although my mother in her last stages um, decided that she had a different husband and family than the one she had. She knew the one she had, but she thought she had this other one too. That was, that was kind of fun. I had fun with it. Yeah. If you can, if you can find the, you know, skip over the, like the weird feelings that that probably elicited and then just roll with it. I, I know that was, I didn't, we didn't have that kind of stuff, but it took me a while to get used to, she would always refer to my dad as her husband. And it took me a while to understand that when I said, oh yeah, he knows where we are. Dad knows where we're going. But that wasn't answering her question. Yeah. Um, when that lightning bolt hit me, it was like, whoa. I mean, that when um, yeah. I have the, there's a designer of the crafty tools that I like. And he talks about his popcorn brain with yeah, the yeah. ideas just popping. And I'm like, oh, I'm not the only person that literally feels these popping thoughts popcorn going brain. off. And, you know, and that's what well, I felt like I that think- day. You know, and I think we, we know more in the research and more experience, people talking about experiences that engagement helps. You got to engage them where they are, right? I had, I did a fascinating interview the other day for a teen program. Mm. And a group of teens asked, how do we uh, treat our grandmothers and grandfathers who have Alzheimer's? And the other... A uh, person was a medical director of an Alzheimer's care unit in in Tallahassee, and he reminded them of that wonderful Chevy commercial mm-hmm. that aired that where the where the granddaughter probably took her grandmother out, and and I said, you know, you just engage, you know, again, dance, color, play card games, uh, sing whatever i mean treat the person with dignity and respect and engage them where they're at not where you think you want yeah. them to be figuring out where they're at sometimes can be a challenge but Hard. when you do you can go kind of go on a fun little journey yeah 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 and sometimes you yeah, can I, learn things you may not have known because old right. history bubbles up old memories come up yeah. for them yeah yeah so you said the name of your book is still me. You're going to have to give me the okay. subtitle again. <laughs> Accepting Alzheimer's without losing yourself. And, and I have a website, Rebecca Chop Enterprise. Well, all of that will be linked in the show notes because I'm sure you guys are going to totally want to read this story because this has been a fascinating conversation. Well, thank you. And thank I, you. I had a fabulous editor for this book and uh, it's filled with good tips and ideas and and also with a touch of humor because you know you gotta laugh as well as cry yep laughing's yeah. better <laughs> laughing well i appreciate fun. this it's taken a few few times for rebecca and i to get together <laughs> and we finally made it so it was totally worth it i appreciate it and um i definitely going to give your book a read and, and thank I'm you recommending it to everybody else because it sounds fantastic Okay, thank you. And don't forget, I want to see those greeting cards. Yep. All righty. Thanks so much. Okay, thank you. Bye. Bye. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your podcasts.